A word about effective plasma osmolality. This is a frequently overlooked value in DKA and HHS, but it's critical to be aware of its significance. It's calculated as two times the sodium plus the glucose divided by 18. The reason for its importance is that patients have a significant risk of neurologic decompensation if their effective plasma osmolality is above 320 milliosmoles per kilogram. I can't actually imagine a scenario in which this value increases further with appropriate treatment. So as with the ketones, it's not needed to follow serial levels. There are a whole slew of additional lab abnormalities in DKA and HHS. Hyponatremia at presentation is nearly universal as a consequence of salt loss during osmotic diuresis, poor PO intake, and the transcellular shifts due to hyperosmolarity. Patients typically have total body deficits of other electrolytes as well, as listed here. This is probably an appropriate place to first point out that while these patients may have a total body deficit of potassium, patients in DKA often will have normal or even elevated serum potassium levels due to transcellular shifts of potassium as part of the complex mechanisms which regulate and attempt to normalize extracellular pH. At this point, I'm going to shift the focus of the talk to discussing the management of these conditions. The four general domains of management of both DKA and HHS are IV fluids, insulin, electrolyte abnormalities, and the precipitating causes. Dehydration is a major component of both DKA and HHS, and IV fluids remain the most important intervention for both. Conveniently, a simple algorithm for the use of IV fluids can be applied to either. Start by bolusing one to two liters of either normal saline or lactated ringers. If the patient is hyperkalemic, you probably should go with normal saline. However, in most cases, the choice of fluid doesn't actually matter. You should consider a series of smaller boluses in patients with a history of cardiac dysfunction. Once one to two liters are in, reassess the patient's volume status. If they still appear severely volume depleted, that is hypotensive, tachycardic, with poor urine output and with non-visible neck veins, continue the fluid boluses of NS or LR until the volume status is more improved. Once the patient is in the realm of mild volume depletion, look at the serum sodium. If it is low or normal, switch to a continuous infusion of normal saline at a rate of 250 to 500 cc's per hour. If the serum sodium is high, use half normal saline at 250 to 500 cc per hour. In patients with a history of heart failure or in those presenting with any degree of hypoxia, you may want to consider lower infusion rates. In all cases, remember that serum sodium shouldn't change more than 0.5 milliequivalents per liter per hour. Increasing the sodium faster than this can trigger central pontine myelinolysis while decreasing the sodium faster than this can trigger cerebral edema. Fear over excessively fast correction should not prevent addressing severe volume depletion and shock very early in management, since the risk from shock is greater than that from these two other complications. Generally, an overly rapid sodium correction becomes more of a concern after you switch over to a continuous infusion rate. As a very general guide, Typical total body fluid deficits in DKA range from about 3 to 6 liters in most patients, while in HHS it is closer to 8 to 10 liters. So now, what about insulin? In mild DKA, that is DKA with an arterial pH greater than 7.25 and serum bicarbonate level greater than 15 milliequivalents per liter, and with an alert patient, sub-Q insulin is a reasonable choice. However, in any DKA more severe than this, or in any form of HHS at all, a continuous infusion of intravenous regular insulin is the preferred route of delivery. There are several different protocols for selection of IV insulin regimens, but there has been no difference seen when compared head to head. Therefore, for simplicity and ease of remembering, I prefer the following option. A 0.1 unit per kilogram bolus, followed by a 0.1 one units per kilogram per hour continuous rate. We are not aiming to immediately or rapidly bring down the glucose back to normal. 
Rather, we are targeting a rate of improvement of no more than 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter each hour. Remember that glucose is osmotically active. Therefore, dropping the serum concentration too quickly has the same risk of precipitating cerebral edema as decreasing the serum sodium too quickly. Once the serum sodium is below 250, dextrose should be added to whatever IV fluid you're using. This prevents hypoglycemia by overshooting and also helps to prevent the aforementioned cerebral edema. As we've mentioned before, hyponatremia is very common to both DKA and HHS due to a transcellular shift of water from the intracellular to extracellular compartments that is triggered by the serum hyperosmolarity. This situation is given the very obvious name of hyperosmolar hyponatremia. As a consequence, these patients who are hyponatremic by numbers may not actually have a separate pathologic condition that directly causes hyponatremia. To correct for this effect, you can take the measured serum sodium and, and add 2.4 times the measured glucose minus 100 over 100. For some reason which I have never been able to determine, a lot of pocketbooks that health staff carry around on the wards cite a correction factor of 1.6, but the literature supports a value of 2.4. Now this idea of the corrected sodium can be very confusing. The initial point to make is that the measured serum sodium is the actual true serum sodium. It's not like the glucose somehow interferes with the sodium assay. Rather, the adjusted sodium is essentially an estimate of what the body's sodium level would be if the hyperglycemia wasn't present. So what? Now how does this affect our assessment? First, when determining effective plasma osmolarity according to the previously me mentioned equation, the measured serum sodium should be used, not the adjusted serum sodium. Also, when determining the appropriate IV fluid between normal saline and half normal saline, the measured serum sodium is the appropriate one to use as well. So why do we care about the adjusted sodium at all? The reason it's important is in the situation where the adjusted serum sodium is still below the normal range. If that's the case, the patient must have another pathologic process contributing to hyponatremia beyond just the hyperglycemia and hyperosmolality. For example, SADH or cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome or something like that. That's the only reason you should ever bother calculating this value. So what about potassium? In both DKA and HHS, potassium levels almost always drop during treatment. In both conditions, insulin directly stimulates potassium uptake by cells, and the IV fluids will improve GFR and its renal excretion. In addition, in DKA, the correction of acidosis will promote exchange of intracellular hydrogen ions for extracellular potassium ions. Because of that additional mechanism, abrupt and a dangerous hypokalemia is more or less limited to DKA and only rarely seen in HHS. In both conditions, however, once the potassium is below 5.3 milliequivalents per liter, the IV fluids should contain at least 20 milliequivalents per liter of potassium. And if potassium is below 3.3 milliequivalents per liter, the insulin should be held entirely until hypoglycemia is addressed. Keep in mind, that these cutoffs are based on guidelines which are themselves a little arbitrary. Also remember that potassium is osmotically active in itself, so adding it to normal saline will make a modestly hypertonic fluid even more so. Phosphate is another electrolyte to monitor. Hypophosphatemia can develop or worsen during treatment as insulin stimulates intracellular phosphate utilization, such as in the formation of ATP. However, routine replacement in DKA and HHS has been shown to have no outcome benefit. Therefore, aggressive repletion is usually reserved for those patients with symptoms or complications of hypophosphatemia, or when serum phosphate drops below 1 mg per deciliter, which is quite uncommon. To remind you, complications of hypophosphatemia include muscle weakness or even frank rhabdomyolysis, cardiac arrhythmias, seizures, hemolytic anemia, and altered mental status. Another major component of treatment is the identification and management of the precipitating cause of the hyperglycemic crisis. The list of potential causes is quite long, but statistically the three most common triggers are gastroenteritis, UTIs, and pneumonia. 
These lead to at least 50% of DKA events. Because myocardial ischemia is another important precipitant, every patient with DKA or HHS requires an EKG and at least a basic assessment for ACS. One last intervention to consider in DKA in particular is IV bicarbonate. Historically, this has been used with some frequency with the thought that it would help correct the patient's acidemia more rapidly. Unfortunately, there are multiple theoretical reasons why this may actually be harmful, and literature and evidence agrees that it is not beneficial. Therefore, guidelines recommend against routine use unless the pH reaches truly extreme levels with a cutoff suggested by some authors of less than 6.90. How frequently should one reassess these patients with hyperglycemic crises? The short answer is very frequently. To be a little more specific, to monitor dehydration, their vitals and urine output should be checked at least Q1 to 2 hours. Their blood sugar should be checked Q1 hour until it is below 250 and stable for several sequential readings. Their electrolytes should be checked every 2 to 4 hours until the crisis is resolved. That brings us to this last slide. How do we determine when the episode of DKA or HHS is resolved? Things to look for include normalization of volume status, normalization of mental status, normalization of the anion gap, a serum bicarb above 18 milliequivalents per liter, and a pH above 7.30. Perhaps counterintuitively, a normalization of serum glucose is not on this list and should not necessarily be expected or even particularly desired during the treatment of hyperglycemic crises. Once the DKA or HHS is felt to be resolved, the insulin drip, if the patient was on one, should be converted over to sub-Q insulin, remembering to overlap the two by at least one to two hours. I hope you have found this lecture on the identification and management of hyperglycemic crises both informative and useful. Once again, this has been Eric Strong of the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University.